widely recognized by many Jews, by many Jews who themselves are proud Jews, practicing Jews, that what's happening to the Palestinian people is wrong. That's why I dislike Joseph's arguments about uh, Palestine and Israel, because he's not honest about it. Right. You know, he, he, he gives this sort of slant that uh, Palestine did not exist. Then you go and look at some of the old archives and you see the word Palestine on buildings dating back to the 30s and 40s. He's not saying Palestine didn't exist. He's saying as a state. He's saying as a state yeah, it didn't exist. The people didn't exist. It was a barren land. And the Jews sort of went there, they built the state of Israel. And there was like just scattered tribes or whatever. When you go back to the old archives of videos and, and photographs, and in fact, I think there was a Jewish historian, I forget his name now. He said, far from it just being, you know, uh, uh, an unoccupied land, there's a flourishing people here, the Palestinian people. So this rewriting of history, I find very uncomfortable, really. So personally, I haven't read the sources. I yeah. don't know. But, I, 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 you know, Josh, Josh, I'd love you for, for you to just watch that debate. Right. And, and the reason why I think it's a very fair debate is because Finkelstein is a, a professor, uh, well known in his uh, uh, academic accolade, right? Recognized by many Jews as well, that ha has provided the finest work on history uh, and has made his place in history. And these are some practicing Jews who've said this, right? They might not agree with all of his arguments, right? Yeah. But they've agreed that, you know, he's an honest, decent fellow, right? You've got Dershowitz on the other side, who's a Harvard professor of law. So he's no layperson like me or you, right? He knows the arguments. He writes his book, A Case for Israel. And Finkelstein, to be honest, totally demolishes him. And not only does he demolish him, but he, I think, categorically proves beyond a reasonable doubt that there is actually manipulation and lies when it comes to uh, the, the, the case for the Palestinians and you know, their right to exist and, and the circumstances that arose uh, as to the expulsion of, all, of these people. Uh, and I think, I, I will assure you, watch that debate and then come back to me, we'll have a discussion about it. Cool. But, right, you know, yeah. yeah. There, there, there are some interesting issues, though, that, uh, that often get brought up. Yes. Um, and actually, I was thinking about one, of, one or two of them earlier today. Maybe I can speak to you about them. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole issue about the blockade with Gaza. Yes. What, what do you think the solution is? Look. Do you think they should just tear down the wall Look, somewhere? the reality here is this, yeah? If you look at the blockade, yes. look, at, look at the sources, look at uh, the United Nations, Look at Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Bet Salem. What are they blocking? The settlements? They're blocking uh, even things like midwife kits, kits for the midwives to give birth to children. What you mean by blocking, yeah, right? right? They're blocking things like chocolate. They're smuggling chocolate in from Egypt. And they're, they're, you know, medicine. And they're saying, oh, the scissors, the scissors can be melted down to make bullets. This is nonsense. Come on. This is utter nonsense. And you know the thing is this, Josh. But the, uh, the, what I'm saying is, do you think they should take down the, the wall? wall? Yeah. Well, under international law, it's illegal. But do you think morally... my my Jewish friends yes. often say that we have a, a legal right to Israel because it was given to us by the United Nations? A lot of Jews have said this to me. Right. They, I don't they, buy that. They, well, you don't because you're, you're orthodox, right? But even so, I still don't buy it because I don't see United Nations anyway, as particularly legitimate. Exactly. Anyway, but even if you were to argue right. that, okay, if the international community got together and they gave this land to the Jews, it belonged to somebody else, but the, some of my Jewish friends say to me, oh, but it is justified because it was given to us by a unanimous, let's say, vote within the United Nations, right? I don't agree with that myself because I don't believe that theft can be justified by anybody. You got taxes, but no, you got taxes. No, no. Listen, theft. Even if the entire world was to stand up, including the Muslim world, and if they justified theft of Jewish land, I would stand up against them. Why? Because my law doesn't come from what people say. Right. My law comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And an injustice to a Jew or a Christian or an atheist is an injustice. I will stand with the Jew, I will stand with the Christian, I will stand with the atheist. Even if my own father is stealing your land, I won't justify it.
okay? Now, so if the United Nations say that this land is going to be given and the Palestinians have to be taken out of this land, for me that's theft. So I don't, but however, my Jewish friends say to me that the United Nations have given us this land. What about the 70, 80 resolutions that the United Nations have passed against Israel? You don't abide by any of those. You want your cake and you want to eat it. On the one hand, you say that you justify it because they gave it to you. But the 70, 80 United Nations sanctions against you to remove the wall, to remove the blockade, to remove the, uh, the cattle uh, grids that you have these people walking through like animals. If you look at the Holocaust, the pictures of the Holocaust. No, we're not, we're not going. No, 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 no. I'm not equating the two. I believe six million Jews being gassed is very difficult to equate to even what's happening to the Palestinian people. But nevertheless, there are some similarities. So for example, where you have those cattle fenced corridors where pe that Palestinians are shoved into the checkpoints, where they stand in the sun for hours on end, only to be humiliated uh, you know, when they get to the other end, yes? Many of them turn back. When we look at the pictures of the Nazis, when they were cattling like animals, the Jews, how deplorable, how disgusting that was. What My question to you, Josh, is this. As a Jew, any similarity to what was done to your people, you should not tolerate when it's done to the Palestinian people. Because as it, it would hurt you to see those images and be reminded of what happened to you, you should not ever justify that happening to another people. And yet that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, you know, the, the utter subjugation and humiliation of a people, the deprivation, the, the, the hit squads that go out every night. Now, this is not me saying it. If you go to ex-Jewish soldiers, the whistleblowers, what are they saying? They say that we will routinely go into six or eight houses every night just to let them know that we are here and we occupy you. We wake up the children, five-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, standing them up. You know, this is utter humiliation of a people. And, you know, don't believe me. Go back on, go on to YouTube. Find, do, you, do your own research. Were these really soldiers in the Israeli army? And that they're giving witness statements of how they harass these people on a daily basis. As a Jew, I think you should stand up against that as well. As a Jew, more so. You know why? Because it was done to your people. Humiliation and subjugation and oppression was done to your people. So you should be the loudest voices against this. Really. It's an injustice. It's unfair. Now, I'm not saying, you know, people say, oh, uh, Muslims, they want the annihilation of, of Israel. They want the annihilation of Jews. I believe that the land was being shared for thousands of years. And the land should be shared today. There should be equal rights for people to work, to travel, to do what they want. If there are criminals that want to cause you harm, arrest them, jail them. Just as if there are criminals within your, uh, you know, your people. If they're criminals and they want to go out and do violence, arrest them, jail them. But don't humiliate and subjugate and oppress an entire people. So what do you think the solution should be? Because well, people often talk about the injustices. There are two or three solutions. Right. Okay, number one. Uh, right, let, let's say you're the Israeli Prime Minister. Professor today. Norman Finkelstein. Right. Professor Norman Finkelstein said something very interesting. He said, just as Gandhi said about India when it split, that I don't expect, I don't accept the legitimacy of Pakistan because they they partitioned right in I think 1948, yeah. Pakistan and India. 47. 47, 48, right? They partitioned, right? Gandhi, as a proud Indian, said, I don't accept the legitimacy of Pakistan, but I accept the reality of Pakistan. Similarly, I don't accept the legitimacy of Israel. And I can't, as a Muslim. As a Muslim, I cannot justify the theft of a land from a people, even if my own father did it, let alone somebody else doing it to the Muslims. So I can't legitimize what they did. But there is a reality now. The land was taken. 
there are people there now second generation third generation what are you going to do with that so what are you going to do well what you would do if you were fair is you would let people have equal rights to land to homes to work you know to the politics of the land to running their affairs and if you allow that now what so, some so, so in that in that vein, do you think therefore they should scrap the Oslo Accords and simply go with we're opening up equal rights to every resident in Gaza and every resident in areas A and B? Well, let's look at the Oslo Accords. Yes. Right? Madeleine Albright, I think, was one of the major, uh, you know, uh, constructors of that accord, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Are you aware of that? I don't know. I don't know okay. the names of this. Mad All I, I know is Madeleine Al Arafat you know what, Ma you know what Madeleine Albright said after, the, well, after it was constructed? Yeah. It's a sort of autonomy for the Palestinian people. Apparently, if I remember rightly, the Oslo Accord meant the Golan Heights was still going to remain within Israel. Israel. Yes. Uh, Israel would still have this, I think, the settlers' road that would dissect Palestinian territory, so you could have military uh, vehicles running right the way through Palestinian land, right. and all of the mountains and hills surrounding the Palestinian areas would still be occupied by Israel. Right. So you'd basically have your guns pointing at the Palestinian people. Right. This is not freedom. Then, this uh, is that's this not is, my question, though. My question my, is. My point to you is this: it was a mass prison that they were asking them to take, right? Okay, position, now the point, the point here is this. You would agree, I would hope, that fairness means that there has to be equality between the people, yes, right? Yes, I agree with you. So th fundamentally that's not the case in Israel. So what I'm saying is, if you want there to be the, the equality that, that you're advocating, which, okay, so in that case, should we then get rid of the Oslo Accords entirely? Should we then take down the wall from Gaza, make everyone in Gaza uh, an Israeli resident, get rid of the distinctions between areas A, B and C, right? Get rid of, uh, uh, right, and give everyone their citizenship of Israel. Well, I, think, I, think, I think that would be a start, but I think what should also happen is you're not going to get a that the hundreds of thousands of Palestinian people that were forcibly removed from their towns and they lost their lands and they lost their uh, houses, there has to be some compensation. Just as the Holocaust compensates the Jews against the governments that were seen as complicit with the Germans, okay, who lost wealth, they lost property, they lost land, there is a compensation for those right. Jews, right? right. Yeah. The Palestinians need to be compensated for their losses. Right. Yes. You know? Right. And there so, has to be equality. Right. So after those two things have happened, right? So this is all way theoretical, and I don't think it's going to happen. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen, right? But theoretically, they get rid of the wall, they give everyone in Gaza citizenship of Israel. They get rid of the distinctions between the areas A, B, and C, and give all of the residents citizenship of Israel. They're all equal. Right? Everyone is equal. And treated equally. Right? right? Equal. Equal under the law. And, and they give compensation to those who were who had their land taken away from them. Yeah. Right? What then? Well, hopefully you live in peace. Isn't Good. It? Do, they, we, do we then? Right? Is there then a need for a two nation, a, a two, a two state, or is it then simply a binational state? The thing is this, right? Because I, I think a binational state is the best solution. Right. Look. It's not for me to decide for the Palestinian people what they want. Right. You know, I'm not Palestinian. If what they want is a two-state solution, then that's their right to, to ask for. Because within the, within the uh, framework of what they feel is fair, according to what's happened to them, it's their right to ask for what they want, right? right. But my personal inclination is that it would be better if there was equality. Now, the reason why I believe that their two-state solution is sought after by many Palestinian people is they don't believe that there will be equality. They believe that what will actually happen is it will be just be a, 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 a one state by words, but in action, actually, it will be something completely different. Like a two-tier system. A two-tier system, right? right? And, and many people, including Mandela, have referred to what Israel is doing to the Palestinians as, a, as apartheid. 
it's a two-state solution. It's a, it's a two, sorry, uh, there's two laws, two different roads for people to travel down. You can't travel down this road, you, can't, he, you can only use this road. Now, this is, this is apartheid. Right. And, and this has to be wrong. It's interesting, actually, because that, it seems to me, and I might be wrong about this, it seems to me that that whole system of the different mini-states, the different autonomy things, has only come about because of the Oslo Accords. So would you then say, if that is, or was it already this type of two-tier system before that? Well, look, um, Josh, if we look at what's been happening since the formation of Israel, there is a, a relentless agenda to exterminate, to get rid of the Palestinian people. And, and since the formation of Israel, 1947, right? 48. 48, sorry. That's why I get mixed up with the Pakistani independence. 48, you have a systematic approach by uh, the Israelis to take all of the land. Now, why, how can I justify that? How can I evidentially show you that is exactly what's happening? The huh? The you go and look at the map of Israel, 1948, prior to 1948, 67, and modern time today. And you look at the stages, Josh, and what you see is the Palestinian territories, year by year, year by year, shrinking. Now, now the, hold on, the thing is this, right? That does not happen accidentally or somehow organically. This is a well-planned, very well-oiled machinery that is systematically taking out these people and stealing their land. Now, what Israel is very clever at is Israel does not want to go in and just bulldoze everything and just take it all in one go. It does it slowly but slowly. It has a long plan. What do we want to achieve in 50 years time and create the least amount of ripples, right, through the world? We keep our propaganda, we keep all that going really strong while we keep slowly, slowly chopping off a little bit here, chopping a lot of it there. Eventually we get all the land with the minimal amount of disruption and ripples as it were around the world and we accomplish our goal. Very clever, very, very clever. But that is what's happening and that's the, the proof of it is that when you look at those maps, you see that, that they've, complete, they've stolen all that, they're stealing all the land, all the resources. 98% of the water in Palestine is not drinkable. It's not fit for human consumption. It doesn't happen by accident. The way the water is directed for Israelis and for Palestine, it doesn't happen by accident. The way that you destroy an economy by when you have a farmer and he, and he has his goods and you let them rot on the checkpoint to destroy the, the economic stability of that person and those people doesn't happen by accident. This is systematic and it's wrong. It's really wrong. And I don't say... I didn't really answer the question though. Which is what? I got the question. No, you That's said right. after the, after you scrap it and there's equality, no, 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 then what? No, then what happens? That wasn't the question you were supposed to. Were what was the question? Sorry, what the was question the question? Was the two-tier system you're referring to that has been compared to apartheid seems to me to have only, to have to have actually started with the Oslo Accords? No, it's from the beginning. I said that. To you. But was there a two-tier system before that? But I've answered that to you. I said from day one. There was only a two-tier system. There's a two-tier system. I tell you why there's a two-tier system. If you, uh, if you look at some of the articles which are well referenced, if only Americans knew, I think that's the website. I'd advise you to have a look at the web and I would say challenge the quotes that they have in there. What you find is that from the very formation of Israel, you have truckloads and truckloads of people on, on gunpoint being loaded and, and villages being emptied out to make room. Right, the, the that's, right. a two, that's a two-tier system. Right. How can there be equality if that's, if that's happening? I'm talking about in places where there were both Jews and Arabs living, right, prior to the Oslo Accords. Was there a two-tier system? Uh, well, I don't know, you tell me. I'm under the assumption that there was not. And, that the, and there was no two-tier system within the citizenry of Israel during the time. 
Right. Are you aware of any, any actual laws that were in place prior to the Oslo Accords that made things different within Israeli citizenry? Because there was no such thing as a Palestinian citizenship before that, because there was no Palestinian territory. I, what I mean is, officially, I, there was no Palestinian government territory prior to the Oslo Accords. Look. That's what I mean. Well, well, this is one of the problems that I find with these type of discussions. To be honest about the question that you've asked, these are the very, very nitty gritties that I, I, I don't have knowledge of, right? No, no, hold on that's a second. That's what I'm interested in. No, no, but hold on a second. No, but that's not all you should be interested in. And the reason why I say this is, is this. Because to some extent, it's irrelevant. Why? I'll tell you why it's irrelevant. I'll tell you why it's irrelevant. Because you can get very, you can get very bogged down in these details, which in reality do not affect the overall dynamics of what is happening and what has been happening. Which is that there is a concerted effort to make this a Jewish homeland for Jews and to take out everybody else there who is a non-Jew. So it doesn't, it doesn't change that reality. So when people, and my Jewish friends are very, very good at this, they study these little aspects of uh, what about this, what about that, what about the, the six day war? But they miss out many other details as to what prompted those actions, right? And the fact that it still does not change the overall concept as to why Israel was created and what the foundation of what Israel was going to be. So all of the other things are often excuses but not reasons. So let, let's agree on those premises of the big macro picture. Yes. Right? On a micro level, yeah, right, when we talk about the specific terms that you refer to, like the apartheid yes. comparison, what I'm suggesting is that, is, that, that, it is that that may not have always been the case. I.e. that that specific comparison can only be justified since the Oslo Accords and not prior. But does it, even, if that, even if that were true, what difference does that make to the overall situation of what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people? Because if the problem of apartheid was started by Oslo Accords, then, then very possibly the logical uh, solution to apartheid is to end the Oslo Accords. Okay, so, so but again, what relevance... What, what relevant, see look, the point here is this, uh, uh, Josh, whether you have the Oslo Accords or you don't have the Oslo Accords, for me personally, I think it's irrelevant. I'll tell you why. Israel doesn't abide by any accord that it doesn't wish to. Israel is a law to itself. If the whole world says, you've got to do this, Israel just sticks up two fingers and says, you know what, we're not going to listen to you. What are you going to do? And the world just sits quietly and they don't say a thing. And the reason why they don't say a thing is that Israel has an incredible reach internationally and it controls very much so, very much so, uh, what people can say and can't say about the state of Israel. And I'll give you an example. The whole thing about uh, if you're an anti-Zionist, you're anti-Jew. I, I would hope that you know that's nonsense. Now, there are some... There is, there is definitely a degree of truth in there. But the, the reason is because there's a huge overlap. The reason, the reason for that statement, I think, is not necessarily a propaganda move, and it may have been turned into a propaganda move, but as an essence, there's a huge overlap between anti-Zionists and Jew haters. Well, a huge overlap. First of all, that's your perception as it, of it being it, huge. It, it would seem to me, it would seem to me that all Jew haters are also anti-Zionist. Okay, but that. But not all anti-Zionists are Jew haters. Yes, but that's see, the big overlap I'm talking about. Right, but Josh, but Josh, but Josh, Josh, you know why there's a problem there? A fundamental problem. And I personally am no, not no, a Zionist. Josh, you know that's, there's a fundamental problem there, right? To, in part, I would agree with you that there are indeed fascist, racist ideologies that masquerade uh, being anti-Semitic by saying that they're actually not anti-Semitic, they're actually anti-Zionist. I agree with you. There are people that are like that. I agree with you that, and you should agree with me, that there are a lot of people who say they're anti-Islam 
when in fact they're anti Muslim. brown face, uh, Arabs, Asians, and what have you, right? Somebody getting arrested? Anyway, irrelevant. The circus goes on. So, what it is. So tell he loves what, getting what, what, what it is, what it is, Josh, yeah, is that I agree with you that there are people who are anti Zionist. I agree with you that there are people who are anti-Zionist and when in reality they're actually anti-Jew. Yeah. They're Jew haters. I accept that. But similarly, there are people who, uh, you know, who might say we don't want Romanian and Polish immigration because of these reasons. But in reality, they're just anti-foreign. They're racists. There are people that hide behind those. Yeah, there are loads of people who say, oh, but Islam is not a race. It's a religion, so it's okay to say derogatory things about Islam. But in reality, when you look at their Facebook posts, or when you look at who these people are, they're, a lot of them are actually just completely anti-foreign, anti-Asian, right. anti-Arab, or whatever it might be. So, they're racist, right? right. Now, the, but the point here is this. Do I now say that you cannot be critical of Islam? No. I say bring it on. I say to everybody, you want to be anti-Islam? Bismillah, bring it on. We'll deal with you. I'm not going to call you an Islamophobe because you are anti-Islam. But if I'm anti-Zionist, people are jump up and say, oh, that makes you an anti-Jew. That conflation, I think, is wrong. Right. There, there, there cannot be a special case for our Jewish brothers and sisters and a different case for everybody else. There has to be equality here. Right. And when we talk about, you know, I hear, I hear some Jews say to me, Oh, but it's because of our special circumstances of the sort of suffering that we had at the hands of, of, of Hitler. And I would say, I as horrific and as horrible and as depraved as that was, what about the black African? Tens of millions of black Africans were loaded up like cattle on ships, just this far apart on shelves the excrement would fall between the planks of the wood like animals and half of them would die in the ship before they would get to the where's the voices for those black African people have they not suffered what about the Indians in the Second World War millions of Indians that's just one event millions of Indians lost their life in the Second World War Muslims Sikhs Hindus right they lost their lives in the Second World War. Where are the voices for those people? Where are, what about their suffering? You go on Park Lane here, there's a memorial for the animals of war. Where's the memorial for the Asian and the black man and everyone else that fought in the Second World War? Where's our memorial? You have one for the donkeys and the mules and the dogs. Yes, there's statues for the dogs, statues for the horses. Our, our lovely animals of war. What about, the, what about the millions of Indians? What about the Africans? What about so many other nations that lost uh, lives in the Second World War? Did they not suffer? So suffering has happened unanimously, universally. But you know, we need Jewish brothers and sisters, and, and there are many, by the way, there are many uh, uh, Jews who are actively, far more active than I am, far more knowledgeable than I am, standing up against the state of Israel and the humiliation, the subjugation and the oppression that they do against the Palestinian people. They are, there are voices and many of them are Jews. Many of them are Jews. And the reason, I remember one of the things that Norman Finkelstein said. He said, both my father and my mother were in concentration camps. His mother, I think, was in Modernahu or Majdanek, and his father was in Auschwitz. Auschwitz, yes, yes. The entire family on his father's side and his mother's side were exterminated. He had no relatives, and he said it's precisely because of the values of what my parents taught me that I will not stand by and watch Israel do what it does to the Palestinian people. That is a man of character. That is a man of honor, of respect. He suffered greatly. He, su he doesn't talk about it, 
but he suffered greatly because of the campaign against him. He couldn't get tenure in universities in America and what have you because he spoke out. And, and you know, when you were smiling, when I said um, Israel has a very well-oiled machinery where it influences much of what happens in terms of politics, you know, because I know that there is this trope that Jews control all the world. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying Jews control all the world. What I'm saying is that it's but common sense. If I have money and I have power and I have influence, I will use it to better me and better my people. It's logical. This is not some conspiracy where you have to sit in dark rooms smoking cigars, okay, and planning and, you know, this is what we're going to do, right? As the trope would, would want you to believe. But nevertheless, this is systematic, Josh. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is systematic, Jew. Uh, systematic, uh, Josh, sorry, right? If you look at, for example, um, during these conflicts, you know, before there was, it was commonly referred to as occupied territories. These territories were occupied. Now you find a lot of the media sources disputed. But that, there certainly are disputed. The, well, and all land is occupied. Look, when you say yeah. when you say disputed, right? There is this air of disagreement. Yes. Yes. But you know, if I steal, if, if I steal your la if I steal your garden from the back of your house, yes, we don't call it disputed. It certainly is disputed. Well, we call it theft. Because if I were to call it, well, it's disputed, it somehow vindicates me, the oppressor, the, the, the stealer, the one who stole, from the crime of theft. I don't believe that should happen. It's not disputed. It is occupied and it's stolen land from the Palestinian people. That is what it is. That is what it should be referred to as. We're, we're, having, we're having a discussion. Man. Sorry. Okay. So, Josh, I, I'm not trying to badger you. I think you're a nice guy. And you know what it is, Josh? I know that we have an affiliation and a love for our people and our culture and our religion. And when somebody speaks against it in some way, though, though I'm not speaking against Judaism, I'm speaking about the state of Israel, a political system, a politi because yeah, you yeah. know, you know, yeah. in the Knesset, is it called the Knesset? Knesset. Knesset, sorry, my, my, my uh, dyslexia, right? The Knesset, yes? Yeah, yeah. Many of those people are not Jews, they're atheists. Yes. They don't even believe in Judaism. Yeah. They don't follow Judaism. Yeah. Many of them profess, they, they, they don't believe in anything. Yeah. But Jewish yeah? is a race. So, so, Jewish is a race. Well, well, when people say Jewish is a race, Nonsense. It's not really, to be honest. Well, not a lot of Jewish in well atheists. there are a lot of Russian Jews also who are not. Se Jews. Are, are, are the Russian Jews Semitic? Semitic. Semites from the uh, lineage of Abraham. Yeah. Abraham, Russian Jews, yes. The the the, Kaza the Khazars, Khazarian Jews. They're Khazarian not Semitic Jews. people, Khazarian are they? Jews don't exist anymore. But because their descendants exist, right? No, their descendants don't exist. But you, are you telling me that all of those people have been completely that, wiped out? That kingdom disappears. But that's what happens to them. If you look at the Safadi Jew, yes. the Safadi Jew more, looks more Middle Eastern. Yes, because that's where they lived. Right. Okay, but that's where they live, but the history is not tens and, of that. And I know plenty of Safadi more. My point, to, I fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so do I, right? But the, my, my, my point to you is that. Not all the Jews unanimously can trace their lineage from Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet Abraham. There are converts who came very... Uh, right, sure, there are converts. Right? Yeah. Okay. That does not mean to say that I'm advocating that you can now hate Jews and claim it's a religion and it's not a race. Because I believe, to me, it doesn't, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant to me whether you're a race or a religion. I don't believe that you should allow bigotry, hatred, and I don't believe you should allow speech that will uh, potentially create uh, ill feeling to an extent where people will attack Jews yeah, or they'll want. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that you should allow that with Muslims either, yeah, of course not. or with Christians, yeah. or even atheists. But in this country, we have a special law for Jews, a special law for uh, Sikhs, for example, because they're considered to be a race from Punjab, okay? 
I'm not saying s strip them of those protections. But I'm saying, hey, what about me? Hey, what about me? What about my children? What about the protection for us? And that protection isn't there. Look, legally, it's not there. So if I say something anti-Jewish, I can be arrested. In fact, I probably will be arrested as an anti-Semite. I will be taken to court and either go through a fine or depending on what I've said, I could be in some countries jailed, right? Germany, if you're, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a Holocaust denier, if you're a Holocaust denier, you go to jail. They deny Holocaust. Some people are stupid enough to do that, right? Some people are stupid enough to do that, right? Now, I wouldn't do, I would never advocate that type of rhetoric because your grandfather may have told you things that he may have seen firsthand. For me to, to, for me to say they were all liars and they all just made it up is, is absurd, right? Yes. And unfortunately, that's what these people believe. They believe in this sort of mass, multi-million people. You are not, listen, you're not nobody. You're the Italian stallion. Uh, you're the no, Italiano. You're the Ita Italiano the of the of Hyde Park. Is that what you said before? Yeah, of course. Before what? No, before was it the state of Israel. So 1948. Yeah. I, got, I got the date right this time, John. Yeah. Before 1948, there wasn't a country called Israel for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years. So according to the Orthodox, you're not supposed to form the state until the Messiah comes back. Is that right? Disputed with the Orthodox. Oh, is it really? Yes. When you say, nice to, nice to meet you. Always nice to talk to you. I always love your accent. There's a beautiful, beautiful, a bellissimo. There's, uh, there's a debate I did with a religious Zionist um, called Mordechai on, uh, on Joseph's channel, on right. the Israel Advocacy Movement channel, yes. um, about, about this subject of... Uh, of Establishing about, a state. About Judaism, yeah. whether or not Judaism forbids a state. Yes. Um, and what I say, and uh, what my teachers have taught me, is that Orthodox Judaism allows for quite a wide range of opinions on quite a wide variety of issues, and this is for sure one of them. And so I would personally see the, um, the religious Zionist viewpoint that we were allowed to establish a state during the exile as legitimate. I don't hold it myself. Right. I don't, I've so when you say that there's, when you say that there is a when you say there's a difference of opinion or there are different views on this yes. subject, in Islam what we do is when we establish some sort of ruling, the legitimizing of a ruling often relates to consensus of scholarship. Right. Do you have something similar to that in we Judaism? We used to have that many, many years ago when we had the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin would issue a ruling right, based on majority and and um, and that ruling was binding and so those rulings are still binding on all Jews today right however since the dissolve dissolution of that institution we no longer have rule by majority we have we have rule by school of thought or by tradition right um, so we still have to follow the old rulings because they're binding because they were made by the Sanhedrin right post Sanhedrin rulings, however, like post Talmudic rulings, um, are, are up for debate. So why, why did they dismantle that then? What, what, was it seen as something that was... Uh... So, it, it dismantled in stages. They, the first things that they got rid of themselves was they got rid of their powers of death penalty and stuff like that because they said the whole point of the death penalty was, that, that God made was supposed to be a deterrent and now it doesn't deter. Um, because people, people simply don't respect God anymore. So there's no point in having these types of punishments and people aren't going to respect the whole idea of it. Before it was a thing to instill, to instill um, um, fear of God amongst the people, right? So the people will realize this is the terrible thing this person has done and therefore God has ordained this should happen. Um, but, so they got rid of that. And slowly but surely, got more and more things they got rid of. Now the, the Sanhedrin, once the, once the Roman exile really 
put in, they, they, they got rid of a lot of their own powers. Um, they got rid of lashes, they got rid of all sorts of things. Um, due to the fact that they didn't have a temple, they, they dismantled even, uh, even more institutions until eventually they, um, they, they, there was no longer people who could form a Sanhedrin. And the reason for that is because to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you needed to have what's called smicha. Now today we have something that's called smicha, but it's not the same. Smicha was started, according to us, by Moses, um, which entails um, putting, the, putting your hands on the student's head and bestowing upon him this, this, um, this role that he's able to make certain rulings and and he'll be able to pick part of the Sanhedrin. It, it's, uh, it, it's preceded by years and years of training and of teaching, by uh, intense teaching by the teacher to the student. And so Moses gives that to Joshua in the book of Deuteronomy. And we believe that that was an institution that continued all the way till, um, till almost the 10th century. Um, the, the last people who had, to, but without a smicha, you can't have a Sanhedrin. So once they decided, um, there was no one who they, who, 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 nobody wanted to get smicha anymore because they thought they themselves weren't worthy of getting it. And people who had smicha didn't want to give it to anyone because they, because they were afraid that people weren't worthy to receive it either. <laughs> so that, um, and in fact, you had the bizarre notion of, um, so the, the last people who held smicha at all were known as the Gaonim. And it was a whole series of heads of, of schools in, in Babylon um, and for a time in Israel as well um, that, um, that continued till the 10th century and you had the last and there's a dispute about the last who the last Goran was they continued passing down the Smicha institution throughout and so they were issuing rulings for everyone why is there a dispute about who the last one was because the second last one of High Goran um, decided to give Smicha and to appoint to, to, to his student of Chizkiagoyim. But Chizkiagoyim said, I know he's given it to me, but I don't accept because I don't think I'm worthy enough. So there's a dispute between the teacher right. and the student about, but practically speaking, from then on there's no So that was around the 10th century? Yes, that was already in the, um, in the 10th century. Right. Um, or early 10th century. So sort of thereafter, thereafter, there is this not, there is not this... Uh, we no longer have a centralised cons power. Consensus. We no longer have that ruling yeah. by consensus. But isn't there a danger with that, Josh? Because then what happens is you can have individual rabbis making quite, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, opposite rulings almost. And people saying, well, we don't have consensus, but I'd, I'd follow this guy here. So, is there not a problem so, with that? So the general rule is what's um, what was codified in in the Mishnah in Tractate of Us, um, chap, um, where it says the words "asay lachor rav," which means uh, make for yourself a teacher. You should find a teacher, a rabbi, and stick with him, right, and follow his rulings. You shouldn't chop and change between different between different opinions. Yes. Right? So you shouldn't say, I'm going to be lenient by this guy and lenient by yes. that guy and yes. lenient by that guy as well. You shouldn't do that. Yes. Um, equally speaking, um, there are many people who say you shouldn't go stringent by this one and stringent by that yeah. one and stringent yeah. by that. Because, it, because, it, because um, I, I see a problem there. And the problem that I see is that with religion and with non-religion, non you'll always have a, a certain number of people who will often have quite extreme views and they'll almost justify anything. Right. Now, where I believe we have protection in Islam is that even if a scholar who is recognized to be a scholar says something like, it's okay to go and bomb these people or whatever, the consensus of scholarship will say it's haram, it's forbidden. Right. And therefore, uh, therefore, you can't have a justification of following that, that particular scholar. So Ijma, Jama, the Prophet Sallallahu said to us at times, when, especially when there's confusion, go with the Ijma, go with the Jama, go with the consensus because logically it is less likely that the consensus would all get it wrong and a very small minority would get it right. So this is I think a very sensible approach that you had uh, unfortunately i think that you gave up in the 10th century which i think opens up to this 
point what you made about, you know, uh, Joseph having somebody on his channel, because from my understanding, um, and again, this is very superficial and, 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 and completely, uh, um, I would say, uh, subjective in, t in the sense that, you know, anecdotal, right? That there seems to be a much greater consensus amongst the practicing Orthodox Jewish community that the uh, state cannot be formed until the second coming of, or the coming rather, not the second coming, because you don't believe in the second coming, <laughs> the first. but the, 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 the coming of the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Am, I, am I wrong in that or? Not quite, not quite. So I'll tell you something. The, in, the, in the late 19th, in the 19th and 20th centuries, there were various arguments between rabbis, mainly in Europe, because this is where these ideas were kind of floating around, um, as, to, as to what exactly should we do to alleviate our own persecution. And there was, the, so you had rabbis like Gabay Tzvi Hesh for example, who founded what is the, uh, the, um, the Chor Tzion movement, which was kind of like a settling movement, um, which predated the Zionist movement. It was an entirely religious movement, um, at least to begin with, uh, when he was head. And he held it's completely permitted because he said that this passage in the Talmud is not actually a legal ruling uh, because my doesn't quote uh, it. As sorry, such. Josh, I'm interrupting, but yeah. my, my, my point. No, no, but I, I'm coming into it. No, I understand but, that there were. But, I understand but, that there are some rabbis so, who. So, so, uh, yeah. At the time, so there were three opinions, but yeah. the, the middle one was the main opinion. I'm yes. going to get to that. So that's one. That's one side. The other side was spearheaded by rabbis mainly like the Munkat Sharov, who was, have you ever heard of Satma? Have you ever heard of Satma? No, I haven't. Satma. No. No. So Satma are a big group. They're, they're in America, they're in Israel, they're also in Stamford Hill. Okay. Um, Yoel, who comes here, he's a Satma. Okay. Um, so the, the Satma Rov, his teacher was the Munkatcha Rov, Rav Shapiro, of uh, Shapiro. And he held it's completely forbidden because he said this ruling is actually a legal ruling. Both of these were accepted by very few people. The main ruling was the ruling by, um, by Rav by Rav Meir Simcha Dvinsk, and he held that although it is permitted, it's not something that we have to do, and and certain care should be taken around how exactly it's done, right? And he is the he ends up being the ruling that is fact that is held by most. So he doesn't hold it was a sin to make the state. He, he would hold that there's certain things wrong with how it was done, and if you're going to make it, it's going to be religious, but you can't be provoking the Gentiles and this and that. And uh, right, so he's got various things, and that is really the, the, the general consensus amongst Orthodox Jews. I happen to be from a minority point of view that actually holds it's forbidden to start with. The rabbi I hold, Rabbi Shemshin of Hirsch, he actually argued with the Kalisha and said what you're promoting is actually a, a, what you think is a big, a big, um, a, a very good deed, a bit mitzvah we call it, I consider no small sin. So th th there's that. The, the general consensus, which became known as the Aguda, which at one point was collaborate, was um, was was having talks, allowed talks with the Zionist movement, and at one point then pulled out when they said you're, you've gone too far. So they, they are really the general consensus, and a lot of people, uh, a lot a lot of Orthodox Jews even, don't realize that that's actually the middle ground. So really, the general consensus is that it is permitted, but in certain ways. What do they say about the rights of the Palestinian people? Should they be given equal rights? So I have to say, there's been very little talk about that issue, mm. because they were talking about because most of these debates have happened before a state of Islam was even right. a possibility, right? The Agada, basically, which was the movement that comes out of this consensus, basically was a movement that basically said, we don't intend on running the country, we don't intend on making any policies, we basically just want to, we just have one thing in mind, which is to make sure that religion is respected in the country. Yeah. And that's basically their entire position. And that's so from your orthodox so position, they haven't really discussed. But yeah. you'll find yeah. that the that within the within the Knesset, you'll find that the 
the members of the Aguda party, the United Terror Judaism party, are much more likely to, um, to be um, a bit, a bit uh, to, um, to open up cross party things with the Arab parties. That's been a, um, something that's been I'm just asking you that in terms of like at synagogue and uh, when, when things are being spoken about, or even in daily conversation with rabbis, with relatives. Does the topic of the Palestinian people come up and, and, and how we can perhaps better live with the Palestinian people? Because from what I've seen, and again, it's anecdotal, and I'm not going to make accusations that this is how Jews think, that, that I don't like doing that, it's not, not fair. But anecdotal, they just seem like as a vermin. They seem like as a, a you, know, you know, that we were there before them, they don't deserve the land. And that, to be really honest, if they get, you know, bulldoze them right out of the country, it doesn't matter, basically. This land belongs to us. So is that the, I mean, so is I that, am speak, I wrong? Am I, I, I wrong in that? Or? I think so. Okay. I, I can't speak for all Orthodox Jews, but just in the conversations I have with people on a daily basis, I haven't heard that type of rhetoric. I have heard the, the, um, the, the rhetoric of, we need to do certain things to protect against terrorists and this kind of stuff, right? I'm sure you're familiar with that. Kind yes. Of um, so you surely hear that. And there are some racists in the community, and we all have them. Of course. Right? I, 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 I have, yeah. There, yeah. There, there, are, there are a few. You know the astonishing um, thing, Josh, is this, you know? You know, what, what, to me, the definition of terrorism, even though people say, well, it's specific, it only means that violence that t tries to change or alter political, uh, you know, political direction is terrorism, okay? I would say, really, the terrorizing of any people it is wrong. Right. And political or non-political, apolitical, doesn't matter, right? And it's, isn't it interesting that the Palestinians are viewed as terrorists when they're not the ones with the guns, the bullets, the Air Force, the Navy, and the nuclear weapons. And the one that has all of that and utilizes much of that, uh, you know, uh, military strength, military power, against a predominantly unarmed civilian population, are the good guys, and they're not the terrorists. I, I find that really odd. I, I find that really odd. The general thing that people, at least in my community, talk, when they talk about this subject, would usually be something along the lines of, I feel sorry for them, they're being kept down by Hamas, and Hamas are, are really to blame. Blame them. Hamas. Right. <laughs> but that, that's, that's, that's the usual thing. And to be honest, it is understandable, because from our perspective, if when Gaza were, had been given to them, and rightly or wrongly, whether or not maybe they should have the whole lands or this or that, like, or well, it should be given to them as theirs to start with, but rightly or wrongly, the perception is that when they gave up Gaza and gave it to them, that they should have, right? If you've got, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade, but here life was giving you much more than lemons, right? Who thought that a country which had all the power was going to give up a huge amount of, of land and take its own civilians out? Who thought that was going to happen, right? And a lot of, a lot of people criticized the Israeli government for doing so, right? The, the, the much more extreme Zionists were, were, were very critical of this idea of land for peace um, that, they, that they talked about. So from our perspective, we say that, look, if you want to start firing rockets from there, then we're going we're gonna to do something to protect. If you're going to start being uh, violent, then we're going to do something. If you're going to vo vote in Hamas, then what do you expect is going to okay, happen? Okay, let me, let me answer that, so, right? Well, they, they could have voted in a more moderate people, and yeah. they could have actually done something good for the people, yeah. and then Islam wouldn't have anything to say You know that. what, I've heard this mentioned many times before. Now, so the, the, the two main perspectives you've raised question. is Hamas and rockets, yes? Okay, there was no Hamas and there was no PLO for the first few decades of the State of Israel. The persecution, the humiliation was there for decades before Hamas even was thought up and came into existence. That's the first thing. Yeah, that's true. Se secondly, under the United Nations, an occupied people have the right to defend themselves and their land militarily using whatever means they have to, ev to evict, Israel to, evict to evict 
the occupier. This is under international law, and this is not un this is not this is not unusual. This is not unusual for as a global consensus of what is justifiable. Okay. So even under the United Nations, even under the United Nations, it's justifiable for the Palestinian people to have an armed struggle against the Israelis. That's the first thing. Now, I'm not justifying the targeting of civilians. Because under Islam, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, even on the battlefield, when the two armies have met, you cannot kill women and you cannot kill children and you cannot cut down trees and you cannot kill the animals and you cannot poison the water. In other words, in other words, you have to, uh, you know what, bro, you know, you know, you, you know what, you, you just have, you just have hate, you just have hate in your heart and you can't get over this cancer, it's eating you up, right? These are the actual words of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam that you cannot do this. So if even if a Muslim goes and targets a Jewish child, a Jewish woman, even a Jewish man who has nothing to do with the, with the conflict, I would say that Islamically, from my understanding as a lay person, that the Prophet's words are very explicit, that you cannot target civilians, right? But armed struggle is even recognized by the United Nations when an occupier occupies your land, you have the right to, 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 to fight back. Now let's look at the rockets that you mentioned. This is a, I feel, a real either misunderstanding of what's happening or a deliberate way of orchestrating or constructing an argument to make one, one side feel that they are the victims, i.e. the Jews, the, the Israelis, and the other one is the perpetrator of violence. There were no rockets for the first so many decades of the eviction of the Palestinian people. That's the first thing. The clock of this conflict did not start with the rockets being fired. My point to you is this. You see, look, Josh, if I slap you and I keep slapping you and I keep slapping you, and after six months of slapping you, you punch me. And then I come and I kill you. And then I say, if you didn't punch me, I wouldn't have killed you. Is that fair? This is not fair. No. Because, the because, been on the because, because since let's, let's, let's have a nice conversation, right? So when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the Jewish brothers and sisters say to me that if they'd ever fired the rockets, we wouldn't have to basically squash them. There's a lot happening before the rockets. Now let's even look at the rockets. In the last uh, conflict, I think it was either Cast Lead or, or Protective Edge. I can't remember the, the name of the conflict. I think maybe ca ca Cast Lead or... Pre anyway, the Israelis claimed there were some, I think it was 5,700 rockets that were fired from the Palestinian territories into Israel. The Iron Dome apparently knocked out some 1700 or something so three or four thousand rockets apparently made it into israel do you know how many homes it destroyed in israel have a guess have a guess have a wild guess one israel then sent in the bulldozers into the palestinian territories how many homes of the palestinians did it flatten have a guess have a guess Keep going, keep going, keep going. 18,000. But the fact that the... Brother, one second, just one second. Let me just finish my argument. Josh, I love Jewish people. I love all people. People often say to me, you're just too soft with everyone. You're too kind to everyone. But you know what? That was the way of the Prophet Wasallam. He never hated people. He hated what they did. But he was not there when the people said to him, curse those people because they're your enemies, they're fighting against you. What did the Prophet say? I have not been sent to curse people. So I have no animosity towards you or your people whatsoever. But what is just is just, what is unjust is unjust, and it's as clear as day. Now, as a Jew, I would say to you, brother, look at these things, go away, investigate for yourself if I'm being honest or not. 
But if they fire rockets and one home is destroyed, okay, and you go and then destroy 18,000 homes, to me, they were trying to, do more to me, that looks like an orchestra. Look, brother, one thing, let me ask you a question, right? Israel is one of the most sophisticated surveillance nations in the world. Electronics, software, armaments. You sell, Israel sells guns to America because they're so sophisticated. Very sophisticated. Some of the most sophisticated software comes out of Israel. The, 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 the app, you know, Waze, the navigation app. Miles better than Google. Who developed it? Israelis. Israelis developed it. They sold it to Google, maybe made a lot of money. Good for them. Good for them. How do all these rockets find their way into, Israel, into Palestinian territories when you have an embargo? When no ship can get in, no car can get in, no truck can get in. How do thousands of rockets find their way into the Palestinian territories? It's a strip no more than, what, 25 miles across? Okay. And what, 80 miles up or whatever it is, 100 miles? Yes. How do these rockets, how do thousands of rockets find their way into the Palestinian they territories? <laughs> because they allow them. Why do they allow them? Because, hey, you fire, we'll antagonize you, we'll keep the embargo going, we'll persecute you, we'll humiliate you, and now we know you will fire those rockets. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yes, we, you will fire those rockets, and then we'll come and squash you. When I was